Hi guys, welcome to another episode. Um, today my guest is Rick Lambert. Rick is the CEO and founder of Sell uh, uh, to Win, and also, he's also a CEO and founder of uh, Inc. Communication. Rick uh, also does a uh, corporate development, you know, leadership training, leadership development, and also he's public speaker. And uh, I also checked out Rick uh, your your podcast shows, uh, Smart Thing, um, great show. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Welcome to the show. Well, it's a it's an honor to be here and uh, speak to your audience today. I've been watching what you've been doing. I think it's awesome as a CEO, business owner yourself, uh, you know, specializes in helping companies with their IT services and whatnot, augmenting their skills. I think it's great that you take time to, you know, do these kinds of fun things and uh, get your name out there for your business. So hopefully today will be a value to your, uh, to your audience. Thank you. Thank you. So walk us through a little bit of your journey. How does somebody grow up to be a marketing guy? You know, how did the whole uh, started? What you were doing before you got into uh, both sales and marketing? So I, I, I'm a Canadian guy. I grew up just north of Toronto. I uh, wanted to be a hockey player like a lot of young Canadian males. And obviously, by the fact that I'm on your uh, show today, that didn't quite work out for me. So I, uh, I, I had a chance to play in the minors and whatnot. And I had a buddy uh, north of Toronto that was selling real estate. And he was listing a house on a Wednesday and selling on a Sunday. And he was telling me wow. all this money he was making me while I was banging around on a bus playing in the minor pro hockey level. And yeah. I thought, geez, you know, maybe there's another world. And so I, I came back. I was really fortunate, uh, 21 years of age, to uh, put together a resume. All I had was goals and assists at the time, but I had a university degree in my back pocket. And I started the Xerox Corporation. I learned uh, I wanted to go somewhere candidly that would teach me strong fundamentals of, of selling. I still think that organization's, if not the best, one of the best in the world. I was a sales guy, sales manager. We wanted to be a VP of sales. And, and Gurmeet, I was hiring people to come in and train my sales teams and uh you know my guys and ladies would say to me hey ricky uh what's for lunch and i knew the guy or lady already lost him at that point these are retired uh -huh. people talking about ideas that have worked you know mm -hmm. back in the 80s at that time so i founded sell to win and I, I i did what at the time what we called motivational sales training events which sometimes had a little odd connotation to it but you know i'm all about real practical implementable what's going to move and crank the wheel right away. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you know, I was doing that for about 15 years. Uh, and then this thing called the internet came along. I don't know if you've heard of this thing. And all of a sudden people said, Hey, I need a website. People are buying online. Yeah. And so I founded a, a digital marketing agency uh, called into communication. So really as a sales coach um, and a digital marketing agency owner, when you bring the two together, uh, we call them smarketing. That's how, uh, that's how that, that came to be. Very nice. So usually you talk to, you know, somebody either doing a marketing or somebody doing a sales, but it looks like you cover the both uh, side, of, you know, side of that, you know, the, the coin. Um, so you already put that, the question to the end. What comes first, sales and marketing for you? The both come together, looks like it. Which came first? Sorry, was your question? The no, usually there's a discussion around the water coolers. You know, what comes first, sales or marketing? Should we do sales first or marketing first? Like you kind of put that to the end. Simply say, listen, both, both are important. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I was a victim as a sales guy of poor marketing. And as a marketer, I know what it's like to have poor salespeople on the front end. And you need both yeah. uh, working together synergistically. And, you know, if you're a, a small, medium-sized business, we work with a lot of large corporations with thousands of salespeople. So we're you know, able to scale our content. But mm -hmm. what, what I enjoy most candidly is working with small, medium-sized businesses just to move in and say, okay, Let's do an inventory of your selling, you know, methodology, your skill set right now, your capabilities. And I'll talk to some of those in our conversation mm -hmm. so your audience can leave with some practical things they may want to try. And then secondly, just do a digital DNA analysis of the company, because I find the smaller companies are quicker, more uh, entrepreneurial in general mm -hmm. uh, and able to make the changes that will drive the results quicker than sometimes the red tape that you and I both know comes along with the, uh, the bigger ship. Right. I see. Has that from your, you know, you've been working for almost, you know, for quite a long time in this, this area. Has that fundamentally changed the sales and marketing or is it the same? Yeah, you know, technology changed a little bit, the way you deliver messages changed, but anything fundamentally changed in these two areas? Uh, yeah, uh, would be the quick answer. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of work in the technology sector with technology resellers. So candidly, our customers are very astute in terms of how they can leverage technology. Mm -hmm. But we come right down to people that, uh, you know, sell clamps for a living, uh, people that uh, run railroad businesses. So I think, you know, the fundamentals of sales continue. So I'm 54 years old as we talk today. I know I look a lot younger, but, um, yeah. the you know, 
I think sales was really changing to a digital, you know, awareness of how do I use these newer tools, LinkedIn, for example, mm -hmm. uh, video, for example. Um, and then when COVID hit, we've just seen a sudden awakening of people saying, you know what, my traditional methodology of act sales activities, sales methodology, et cetera, you know, needs a quick pivot to uh, be digitally enabled to drive the results that hopefully they were achieving before, if not greater uh, mm -hmm. today. So yes, it's changed considerably. I see. How about delivering product and services during the time of COVID? Um, there's so many messages out there, Rick, from a marketing standpoint, you know, government's putting messages out, you know, for, for health reasons, you know, definitely those messages needs to be there. Um, is that creating challenge from a marketing standpoint to get your message across or get uh, telling your client's story out there? Um, how about also from sales standpoint, is that creating any challenges or is it making it simple for people to get the message across? So, you know, good question. Um, you know, I think that there was a lot of noise in the marketplace before COVID hit. Uh, okay. You know, we've got senior citizens on computers now. We've got, you know, uh, I got a couple Gen Zs of my own. So you've got a wide range of people now that are digital savvy. We call them digital natives if they grew up with it. So I think the key, you know, to getting your message to land and stick is really understanding, you know, who is your customer that you're after. Mm -hmm. um, understand kind of maybe what we would call their buyer journey. And uh, for those that might, you know, think, okay, what's that mean? It's basically understanding how someone you would sell to would come to be aware of what it is you have to offer, mm -hmm. you know, to inspire them to maybe consider change, then basically nurture them along to the point of making a decision. You know, we, we find that the old school, you know, door knocking and whatnot, the skill sets and the premise of those activities still apply. It's just, we have to do them in a different way now. Um, you know, as per the messages, um, you know, there's an old saying, right? You got to ride a horse in the direction it's going. And so mm -hmm. a lot of the messages, you know, we'll talk COVID maybe for as an example, you know, have been congruent with some of the sales messages that, that our customers are using that use the COVID message to propel them uh, mm -hmm. forward to create more sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. So, so the clients you're helping out, uh, Rick, uh, on business leaders or, 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 or uh, business owners, what, what is the obstacle they, they're facing with? What, what, what is the biggest, you know, the challenge you, you know, um, uh, come across? Is it, is it a taking a new change or is it simply education piece? You know, what, what do you see a bigger obstacle for, for these uh, business leaders? Um, okay, so, so business leaders. Okay, so what we're talking, let's say, small, medium-sized business. Is that sure. fair? Or, yeah, uh, yeah, let's start from there. I, 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 I asked that because... You know, when we work with, you know, global organizations, which we do as well in multiple languages, different cultures, you know, a whole bunch mm -hmm. of stakeholders per se, sometimes the leader is not really as dominant as maybe small, medium sized business. So the challenge I would say that most leaders have um, right now is, you know, you, you, your business has in some cases uh, grown. Uh, our business has grown as a result of this new digital wave, mm -hmm. uh, or you need to, as I mentioned earlier, pivot. And I think, you know, I, I wrote an article recently, which I think we'll talk to about 10 things I think business leaders need to do mm -hmm. just to do a dipstick on their current sales and marketing position to understand kind of where they sit versus the norm. And the things I talk about, quite frankly, are, you know, they work across different industries. But the biggest challenge I think for business leaders now is, is how do they benchmark what they're doing? Maybe it's validating that they're doing the right things mm -hmm. or understand if they're not of a sales or marketing background, that may not be their forte. You know, sometimes it's nice for them to have an objective third-party perspective to say, look, you know, why are you guys running up the side all the time? That's exactly where they're tackling you. We need to go this way over here and fly over top. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we uh, and I, I'm not just saying myself, there's a lot of very talented people that do similar things to what we do, perhaps. But what mm -hmm. I think we bring is a cross section of industries. So what's working for big company, small company, you know, U.S. based company, global, there's typically common best practices that a leader can you know be awoken to quickly to go, OK, I better plug that hole and shut that door and lock that window quickly. Mm -hmm. And how easy it is for business leaders to take on that, that, that uh, you know, that kind of uh efforts that, you know, Rick, from, um, you know, every time you take it on a service as a business leader, you know, either you need to be educated or you need to change a few things the way, you know, the way you've been running before, you know, it's just a different way of doing it. Um, change scares everybody. 
Um, how difficult is that on a personal level? They may have to look at a different skill set. You know, uh, I've been running my sales and marketing this way. Now I got to go this way. I may have to educate myself a little bit on, on this. Also, the change management, you know, uh, change comes down to staff. You know, it comes to people management. How big is that change and, and how do you think uh, people react to that? So I, I can only speak to the to our approach. I mean, change mm -hmm. is a scary thing for a lot of people. And, you know, with people with not that much hair like myself, change sometimes becomes more <laughs> difficult, you yeah. know, more tight mm -hmm. you get. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we try to do, Gurmeet, to be honest, is we try to not just make the leader the change, the change agent. Um, yeah. Typically, you know, I spoke to, for example, about uh, a few hundred golf course superintendents uh, two weeks ago. And uh, they wanted me to talk on how to sell an idea within a golf course. Okay. Yeah. And you may say, okay, wow. Like I, 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 just so you know, I'm a terrible golfer. And uh, they brought me in because, you know, they wanted to learn not golf, but how to sell an idea. Yeah. And one of the things I did before I suggested the change was I asked them to speak to several people that would be within the group I was speaking to. Yeah. And where I'm going with this is I think sometimes a leader needs certain people within the organization to be the leaders of the change so that the leader mm -hmm. isn't always the one saying we're going left, we're backing up, we're going forward. Mm -hmm. So we work really hard to be honest to not sell, but I think create awareness in the leader and then the leader's circle as to what, why, and how we might do that. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got the right partner, and you know, this is a business leader yourself. There's some customers that you want. There's some maybe you don't want. There's some people you would trust. There's some people you wouldn't trust. And when we're dealing with people in a company's brand, like you got to make sure you got the right person that's directing you where to go. And I always say to people, you know, especially when COVID hit, I think, especially when it comes to your marketing, like you need to select your marketing agency. I believe mm -hmm. now, like you would select a lawyer in a case that you have to win because it's highly mm -hmm. competitive. It's very specialized. And if you get a good one, you can really do quite well. Yeah, especially with the, with the COVID that uh, Rick, you mentioned, you know, a lot of companies I know or business leaders I've been talking to, you know, they all have to reinvent, uh, you know, their, their own product and services. You know, even the product they were doing before, you know, maybe the way they deliver those products to clients that change, you know, um, same as the services, you know, the services are the same. Yeah, maybe the way you deliver the services that change. So they kind of have to reinvent their own product and services and the marketing is critical piece to it, you know, that, you know, you change the product and services, but how do you communicate that to the client now? Well, you know, I, 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 I worked, I was a Coca-Cola delivery guy mm -hmm. uh, as, a kid, as a summer job. And I'm going to get yeah. back to your question here. Okay. And they took Coke Classic off the shelf. Now, this is a, you're probably too young to remember this, but as a delivery guy, I got more trouble from store owners. Like, why did you take Coke away? And, uh, you know, it's funny when they brought Coke back, there was a, a, a resurgence in the product, Coke Classic, et cetera. And my point is so, sometimes I think we have a really good product and it's just not marketed effectively. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sometimes look for something else that may replace it. And so sometimes it's not all about change. It's sometimes about maybe placing focus on something that you're really, really good at mm -hmm. and maybe being a little more to the point um, you know, less jargon, more layman about what this is and why someone might want to consider it. Mm -hmm. And in saying that, you know, what we're finding is actually the less you sell, uh, be it on social media, uh, in, in, in Zoom sessions, et cetera, often the more you will sell. And, and, you know, we're big on the education versus promotion kind of model. Gotcha. And it's been working really, really well for our clients. Mm -hmm. And, and when you, on that topic, when you're not trying to sell, how big the story part comes in, you know, the telling a story, especially in a technology side, you know, if you're dealing with a lot of technology, but, you know, uh, very hard to explain, you know, a technical concept to some other business leader, but if you can uh, put it in a story format, um, if you can talk about the importance of that, how does that fit in into the marketing? So it's funny. Uh, so stories. So, uh, you know, we're hired by a company. Uh, it's about a 400 employee company. Mm -hmm. And uh, the owner of the business, very successful, former IBM or been through every corporate training program there is, okay. said their biggest problem is they don't have a story. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they're in the IT space. They offer a different stack of services and whatnot. And, you know, Gurmi, you, you know, this is a business leader. I'm sure your people do as well. We could go right now to 10 websites. And I mm -hmm. bet 
know, six out of 10 at least with, with their story is we offer great service. We've got yeah. the best people. We've got yeah. all these vendors we've got. And really, you know, in my opinion, as a sales guy, if customers can't tell the difference between your story slash your value proposition versus somebody else, they all default to the uncommon denominator, which is price. Mm -hmm. And I think that's unfair for a lot of people. And so, you know, your question earlier about what, what are you, what, what's the challenge that leaders have is I don't think they have sometimes people internally to challenge, is their story strong enough? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when COVID hit, there were a lot of people in the U.S. furloughed. We've got, you know, Canadian cutbacks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes that middle rung of management are a little apprehensive, depending upon the culture of the organization, of course, to really challenge, like, are our skates sharp enough right now to play in the game that we've got going into? Like, you know, when I talk to sales groups, often I'll ask them, have you in the last three months, three mm -hmm. months, visited your top three competitors' websites? And it's astonishing how few of them have done that. And yet that's the latest story they're telling. And so, you know, how can you really create my argument is your own story if you don't know what the stories are the other guys are telling. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's so just basics, candidly, a lot of times. So what they're looking for is a story from when, they, when you're recommending to visit the site or, or I know what's new in the market, what, what they're looking for uh, when they're visiting those sites. What are they looking for in the competitor sites? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if you, okay, so what, what I suggest anyway is they look at not just the website, but the social media, because the social media is the daily news that they're talking about. That's and it. it surprises me how few business people will not only visit their competitor's website, but, you know, connect with them through social media so they see the current feed or, or attend a webinar that a competitor is, you know, is, mm -hmm. is doing. Because you and I both know that in most webinars, you know, the company story is delivered in about the first 90 seconds. You know, this is who we are. This is what we do. This is why us. And then they get into the topic and then sell yeah. for the next 30, 60 minutes. But I just think our head's in the sand if we don't look at what our competitors are doing. Because candidly, you know, success leaves clues. I always tell people, and, and you may see something in a competitor that you like that maybe you can do it differently or better. And I think that's how the McDonald's restaurant was formed, right? There are lots yeah. of hamburger places, but they did something similar, but their story was very, very different. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, on that story piece, uh, Rick, I know sales and marketing from, from that angle, you have to tell the story, you know, uh, you need to uh, make sure you, you know, believe in story, but that, that belief part on a story, how important is that? Uh, if you can talk about that, you know, what sales and your marketing side, your story you're telling, your service side has to deliver that story on a daily basis that, you know, the, the, the quality you're talking about, you know, the result you're talking about that, you know, in the sales and marketing and service has to deliver. Do you see from your experience with the, working with a business leader that there's a struggle between those two, that sometimes the result's not there, what the story needs to be told, you know, we're telling out there. And business leader making a changes and trying to align those two pieces that we need to deliver exact same result even a more that that story we tell another site. So um, let me ask your audience this: mm -hmm. When was the last time you had someone in your organization that's responsible for telling the story, probably a salesperson, mm -hmm. deliver your story to you? And mm -hmm. uh, I would say that right across the engagement process. So for example, you know, the story starts with, I would say the initial approach when you're trying to prospect or engage a customer mm -hmm. that can be in the form of email. Maybe it's a social, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ping, or maybe it's um, a phone call, whatever the model is, mm -hmm. the story has to, you know, start there and continue across. And I think that, it's assumed by a lot of business leaders that the story being told on the front line to the customer is what was discussed in the boardroom. But often in the boardroom, when you know you or I as a leader, we roll through our six bullets on the slide and we ask, is everybody understand how to tell the story? <laughs> and everybody says yes, and then they go to tell a completely different story. Yeah. So um you know, role playing is something that I grew up with in the Xerox Corporation. Literally every morning we would have to review with our sales manager. What mm -hmm. is the story for this customer? Because the story also may rotate according to the customer, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. What is the story with this customer? What's this? And, and we would literally role play it. 
And I think that candidly, that's a lost art. And that's why I go back to my comment. When's the last time you had someone in your organization mm -hmm. uh, send you a prospecting email, leave you a prospecting voicemail, deliver the slide deck, whatever it is you've got, mm -hmm. so you can hear what's going to the front end. I get you. So let's talk about the role playing. You know, we we a uh, big proponent of the role playing. We do every morning. So I want to hear a little bit more from your side. What are you recommending clients that you know the role playing? How often they should do it with us? You know, sales team or with the service team? Um, and and uh, you know, and and um, is it only for sales or is it also for service team? And and what are you guys recommending that how often, uh, especially with the COVID, now the messaging is getting lost. We're not working out of the same office. Um, is it still important to role play even though we're not sitting in the same office? Well, you know, it, it, you know, I come from an athletic background and, you know, whenever you're facing adversity, most elite athletic teams or individuals will go back to basics, right? Golfers, mm -hmm. hockey players, whatever. You go back to basics. And the basics are things that you'd role play. Now, I'm a big believer in you've got to make it fun. Uh, you've got to, you know, we use a lot of what we call gamification in the role plays. So it's not as, uh, you know, hey, you know, John, you're going to sit down and now you're going to tell me the story. Yeah. For example, I worked with a company in Phoenix, large company, uh, about $80 uh, million in revenue, uh, mm -hmm. national footprint, and their sales reps were facing resistance about something around their product. They'd had a product flaw in the past, and then we knew it was going to come. Mm -hmm. So uh, great company. So we came up with a, I brought them a deck of cards, and I sat in their boardroom, and I said, okay, look, at, let's come up with every objection you think the customers are going to come up with around this particular scenario. And I'll write them on the back of a card, literally with a marker. And then what we did was we literally dealt the cards and the person flipped over the card. Now, the, the, the gamification to it was that the rep, in this case, the sales rep, wouldn't know what the objection was before it was turned over, which is kind of like a customer because the customer doesn't say to you, hey, Gurmy, I'm going to tell you right in about two minutes. Yeah. This is a problem. You know what I mean? So. And then what we did was every meeting, you would basically deal out the cards, boom, boom, boom. Okay, Jimmy got this one, Mary got that one, Gurmi, you got this one. And, uh, you know, as a young sales manager, I used to use that model, but with a ball. And we used to throw a ball around in our boardroom. At that time, we were in physical settings. So, okay, here you go. Your price is too high. I'm happy mm -hmm. with my current customer. You know, all those things. So frequency, I would say as much as you can do it. Uh, make it fun to keep people coming back. It's always got to be a positive experience. And, um, you know, the, another way to just on the story is often, you know, in, in your business or my business or, you know, someone mm -hmm. watching today, your customers will ask you for a concession. They'll mm -hmm. say, hey, I need it delivered quicker. Or I need more servers, whatever it is. I need a deal. And I think there's an opportunity that's often missed by business leaders to have their people ask the customer for something in exchange that helps them build their story. Mm -hmm. For example, if somebody asked you, they said, hey, Gurmi, I know you guys are great at augmenting, you know, the IT capabilities we have internally. Maybe it's, you know, backup disaster recovery, whatever it is you can do, but I'm going to need this concession, right? And something mm -hmm. you've got to give up. The knee-jerk reaction we coach our clients to say is, hey, if I'm willing to do that for you, how would you feel Mr. Customer, decision maker, et cetera, attending one of our upcoming sales meetings, mm -hmm. okay, Tuesday mornings at 8.30. Yeah. And if you're okay with it, I'd like you to discuss who you looked at, mm -hmm. what they said, the competitors, yeah. and why you selected us. And so oh. a lot of times, you know, we drink our own Kool-Aid around why we're the best, but mm -hmm. too seldom do we bring the customer in to coach us really on what is really coming from the other parties nice. and how we may want to, what we may want, may want to leverage as a strength through the customer's eyes. And this is done mm -hmm. by our marketing agency all the time with customer videos on, you know, hi, my name is Rick Lambert. I selected sell to win because we looked around, we were looking for this, this, and this, and we found, you know, that type of, mm -hmm. but um, just some yeah. ideas there anyway. No, that, that kind of validates, you know, if you are the best, why you are the best? Um, you know, it kind of validates, uh, you know, back and forth with the client. And plus the client's telling the story, you know, how well you, how effective you are when you were telling your story. Yeah. It, it, you know, so, so you talk about stories and I think it's a great topic because one of the things we're seeing now on our digital marketing side, and it's been around a long time on the sales side is it's a real skill to be able to tell the same story, but in different ways. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I hired a lady that runs my digital marketing agency. Her name is Cheryl Weedmark. She's a former CTV anchor person. Mm -hmm. And I wanted her because I knew that DNA every day for a decade, she had to get up in the morning and she didn't know whether she had to come up with a story about, you know, a cat in a tree, this house fire, this going on. And uh, so storytelling is a, is, a, is a real skill. And I think a knack people have, mm -hmm. but there's different ways to go about building your, uh, you know, your base of stories because you need to always be changing the pitch. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, and I don't mean that like just in terms of a verbal pitch, but the way you wrap your story. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where obviously people that do that for a living can come in and say, Hey, you know, I know you asked for a circle, but here it is oval. This is the way it looks like this. We'll twist it like that to right. keep the waves hitting the beach. Mm -hmm. So, you know, business owner, uh, you know, um, we talk about a lot of things, uh, Rick, you know, business owners who, you know, um, pandemic's not over yet, you know, but definitely a lot of people looking over it, you know, it's going to be over, you know, what's, what they should start thinking about, you know, um, listen, everybody wants, when this whole thing is over, you know, the people being vaccinated right now, um, as this is over, we all going to struggle to get back to the revenue levels, get back to the production levels. And uh, so what are you recommending? What, what, you know, what kind of items that you should start working on? And what's, what's uh, you know, if they're planning their strategy, what should they start thinking about um, in, in terms of both sales and uh, marketing? So um, I think on the marketing side, in the same with the sales side, you have to be honest with yourself. I mean, sometimes you don't know if you got a plow horse in a position where you should have a racehorse. And you love the plow horse because the plow horse has been there for years and the plow horse knows all this and the plow horse knows that. But you, I think now is the time for companies to take inventory of their current state. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, like when it comes to your website, just the basic thing that customers can do on their own is that, you know, they may want to open up, um, uh, you know, in Chrome, you can open up what's called an incognito view, mm -hmm. which eliminate your historical search patterns and Google on something that you sell, not your company name, but see how you come up in your market. And um, I'm just saying, I think with, as we kind of come around the corner, maybe on this pandemic thing, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for people that have been early adopters in terms of readiness to go after this next wave. Mm -hmm. I have close friends that are in the financial uh, market. I mean, some of them are predicting a roaring twenties coming back. I don't know obviously what it is, but all signals in terms of my business are very positive on all fronts that people are starting. We're seeing growth. We're seeing mm -hmm. companies start to take risks again and go after it versus, you know, being a recoil cost cutting kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. But um you know, there's certain things that we talk about, and I don't know if you want to get into some of those things now in terms of how specific someone might want to do to take an inventory of their current state. I'm not sure if you want to get into those yet. Sure. Yeah, we can. If you want to list those things, we can quickly get get through that. Um, but you know, some of the stuff you you know, items you talk about, Rick. You know, those items people don't have to wait till this COVID's over. Some of that work, you know, they can do right now. Um, if you can do marketing and a lot of marketing, you know, story building and 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 all that, all the work needs to be done on our marketing side. Also on a sales side, I know there's a lot of work you talk about that could be done before, you know, before we uh, get back to offices and, and started, I know, um, increasing or, you know, getting back to the revenue levels that that work could be done um, before that. Well, you know, I, if you're waiting until this is over, you could be one of few people waiting. I mean, yeah. I would argue that your competitors, whatever industry you're in right now, they're thinking 30, 60, 90 days. And then what happens beyond 90 days? You know, is uh, you know, here's some things that we suggest. Basically, mm -hmm. you do a dipstick on your current. I, I I call it your sales offense. Okay, sales and marketing. So number one would be if you're a business leader, take a look at your sales or customer facing employees LinkedIn profile. Now look, when when we all went underwater with this COVID thing last March, and it was snow day, we didn't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Then there were a bunch of knee jerk responses. But I think once people settled and realized, look, this is going to be a ride for an unforeseeable, you know, period. We did a lot of work. We had, uh, I mean, even last month, we had 500 business to business salespeople graduate through my 30 day LinkedIn bootcamp. Oh. And why? Mm -hmm. Because we can't communicate through digital means, even through phone. You know, if people were working from home, their corporate, you know, extension wasn't reaching them. So, um, 
if I was a business leader, number one, I would take a look at my sales representatives, at least LinkedIn profiles and back okay. on your comment with the story. Do they look like we want them to look like, is it a picture of a guy cut out of whoever he went to the wedding with, with yeah. half a drink in his hand is the background, the default. So, um, and are they basically communicating the story? Because I would argue that that's the new website for the people that you've got sitting in front of your customers and candidly 80% plus are just a disaster. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, on that end, you know, when it gets to LinkedIn, one of the things that we believe is that that is the new watering hole, the new digital watering hole, where arguably, again, 80 some odd percent of business leaders go. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we suggest a cadence of three to five posts per week, no less than three. And you may say, Rick, you know, why three? Well, um, the, uh, the algorithms that uh, LinkedIn uses uh, allow a post, basically the lifespan of a post is 24 hours or less. Okay. So I, I look at them as digital billboards in layman terms. And the more digital billboards we can get out there in front of those potential customers, even our existing customers, mm -hmm. because candidly, a lot of them, I'm sure, Gurmeet, you get the same as I do. And they say, yeah, 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 Gurmeet, we just got a whole new server set up. You're like, I, we could have done that for you. I didn't know you were into servers. You know? like, so, <laughs> yeah. so a lot of times it's educating your own customers. And mm -hmm. we just think LinkedIn's a no-brainer. And yet and it, so few people... Uh, business owners have really jumped on it and and to that end you know have it as part of their sales activity mix so where I, I come from a background of you know this many cold calls being door knocks this many phone calls this many emails was all a formula that drove a mm -hmm. certain sales funnel yeah you know i think linkedin should be absolutely part of a, a sales yeah mix that's a great point uh, rick because uh, you know during this this covid a lot has changed you know people change vendors change you know uh, people move around a lot you know companies change right uh, how many companies you to see go through M&A, you know, mergers, acquisitions, you know, a lot of has changed. So I think it's a very important what you just mentioned that, yeah, LinkedIn page has to be updated. Please, you're showing that what company, uh, you know, you're still working for is just simply the company's changed, the company consolidated, the mergers, a lot of stuff happened during the COVID. Uh, not updating, you simply have just have old information. So, so believe it or not, I work with some older business owners and they yeah. dispel social media because that's a kid thing, right? Yeah. And the way I explain it to them is I say, look, okay, forget about the social media side. Let's say one of your sales reps has a good relationship with Susan at company number one, okay? And Susan's done all the right things for your business to earn that ongoing you know, revenue or wallet share in there. And all of a sudden, Susan's customer, Jim, he gets let go or there's an M&A to your point or something. And Jim goes over to company two. Yeah. How does Susan know that Jim left there, who she's got good equity with in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, willing to buy from her relationship? How does she know he went over there? And so if you're as simple as connected to your network, the potential buyers or existing customers on LinkedIn, you'll get a notification that says, hey, Jim just left and has got a new position over here. Okay, so we can go over here and sell on something now. Yeah. That's the way I explain it to more tenured people. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, you know, back into the activity mix, we, we suggest that sell to win no less than 30 net new connections per week mm -hmm. with, with current or potential customers. Nice. 30. Nice. You know, it oh. seems aggressive maybe mm -hmm. to someone watching right now because, but it comes down to like, you need to look at, there's, there's a skill around your invitation. So many of the invitations, for example, on LinkedIn look like a prospect email. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Rick Lambert. I run one of the number one training companies, you know, we're all the best and I'm going to just, you know, yeah. we were very simple in terms of our, the less you sell, the more you sell, just get them in the network. Then they'll mm -hmm. start to see your digital billboards. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's number two? I get the LinkedIn is definitely, you know, most critical one. Yeah. The other thing is um, I, I think, uh, you know, you, you brought up the story concept and I was talking about prospecting and I, I think a lot of uh, sales leaders and business leaders expect their people to do certain activities that traditionally has generated certain results. Mm -hmm. And often I'll use the analogy of a bald tire and, and here in Canada, you'll get it, but Maybe Americans won't, but in Canada, in the winter time, we change our tires to snow tires. Okay. Mm -hmm. And why? Because we know that we would be spinning our tires on ice in the snow. And so the same applies to prospecting in that if you have not got good prospecting skills, phone, email, LinkedIn mm -hmm. engagement, these, these down the middle 
uh, engagement, uh, uh, you know, tools or mediums, whatever you want to call it, uh, you could be spinning your wheels. So yes, you've done your 100, 200 touches a, a week, but the same way as the car doesn't go anywhere when you're spinning. So what we try to do is we try to uh, put chains on the tires in terms of the prospecting. So for example, your prospecting talk track, I don't think should be any longer than 35 seconds. You're prospecting email, no paragraphs, no attachments, bullets instead of a bunch of sentences, Mm -hmm. Clear call to action at the bottom. You know, the stats all indicate a three line email gets read 30% more often. I mean, we're into mm -hmm. a whole bunch of overwhelming messages, as you mentioned earlier. So yeah. I, I think that the, the simplification of the message, mm -hmm. smaller micro messages seem to get through the net more and create more conversations uh, to start or create sales cycles. Mm -hmm. But that requires a lot of discipline, a lot of hard work, and and and, and a lot of uh, structure around the sales process, Rick. You know, is that something you you uh, uh, coach people? Is that something you you know you help them achieve that that discipline and the structure and and that that you know that the the work ethics that required on a on a daily basis to get through the work? Well, you mentioned a couple of things: skills and work ethic, right? So mm -hmm. I've met a lot of really skilled salespeople that have no work ethic. Okay, <laughs> yeah. and I've met a lot of really hard workers that you know, like I always say, uh, you can't make a plow horse a race horse. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's funny, you know, I've done over a thousand paid speaking events, and uh, our audiences are typically fifty to five hundred. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, after each one, if it's a sales audience, which is my normal audience. The sales leader, one of the leaders will come up to me and say, hey, Rick, what did you think of our people today? Okay. And I'll say, uh, well, what do you mean? They say, well, do you think, do you think they're any good? Yeah. <laughs> and and you look, at, you know, I, I'm typically honest with them. I say, look, at, Rick, I can normally tell who the top three are group very quickly. And you can just tell by their body language, the way they're taking it in, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but uh my point is sometimes people want to complicate whatever it is they're doing. And what we try to do for our customers is understand, okay, what, what is it you're trying to sell? What is your current value proposition? What does the competitive landscape look like? Uh, what have you talked to your customers at all about why they selected you? You know, Gurmi, old school sales training taught me, probably mm -hmm. you maybe as well, with the concept of ask customers why you lost the deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is great because then you beat yourself up in your four doors today and all the way back to the office. Right. Mm -hmm. But instead, you know, we coach our customers to ask their customers why they won. Now you don't do this at the point of signing. You don't say, Hey, Gurmi, thanks for signing my order. By the way, why the heck did you select us? Inappropriate timing. <laughs> yeah. But maybe you wait a week or when the implementation is going on and you say, Hey, Gurmi, you know, I know you looked at different vendors, you know, is, is consideration for your uh, project here. And I'm just wondering, just out of curiosity, like, why did you select us? And whatever came out there is probably the lure, one of them you want to use going forward to catch more fish. I just think it's an underutilized mm -hmm. approach. So in short, we create sales playbooks for our clients that mm -hmm. are literally cut and paste templates, insert, bang, and then it moves across the buying process from their proposals, their presentations, all that kind of stuff. So you take all the administration stuff away from them and automate all the stuff so, you know, they can, they can run like, you know, old machine on a daily basis. Well, think about how long it takes. Yes, is the quick answer. Think about how long it takes a typical person to type an email. I yeah. mean, if, if well, you're, if you're mm. right, if your people are doing that over and over and over, especially salespeople where we specialize in, number one, you could be repeating that bald tire. Okay, mm -hmm. over and over again, ineffective, right? Which really doesn't do anybody any good. Never mind, like the sales rep gets down and they don't think anybody's buying, and there's a whole tailspin in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, you know, it's important to I think when you introduce new methods to measure them because uh, you know what's working for one rep. I find in a digital world, we've lost what I call the mortar between the bricks. Mm -hmm. I think there's transaction. I think there's conversations, but we miss the transactional conversations in the middle. That hey, Gurmi, did you try that template the guy Rick Lambert suggested? Did you try that? In pro oh, you did try. It. Well, how did it go? Okay, it's, it's it's bigger conversations I find, and not enough little ones about what's working. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing too is, um, you know, I mentioned like the website is the ultimate twenty-four by seven storyteller for any business. I think. Mm -hmm. And most business leaders uh, 
have never had a website assessment. So the same way your organization would go in and do a network assessment and say, hey guys, you've got all these open ports right here where someone could come in with malware, you've got this disconnected, you know, you got a mixed bag, whatever it is your assessment would show. Mm-hmm. We do the same with a website. And I just think, you know, going back to your storytelling, who's going to tell your story more than your website? I don't yeah. know. But yeah. people got to find your website, first of all. Mm-hmm. And there's tools out there that people can use. You know, if you Google uh, HubSpot, you know, web grader, for example, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a free tool. It's a link. You can put your, your web domain in there. It'll tell you, OK, you know, you, you're wearing no helmet. You've got no skates on and your stick is curved the wrong way. Like you wouldn't yeah. even know. Mm-hmm. these things so there's a lot of free tools that people can use but i think the website in terms of storyteller is very very critical uh especially mm-hmm. in today's digital world yeah definitely you know it's uh it's uh, that's where everything starts right that's, that's you have a uh, enough space on a site to tell all the story instead of uh, trying to do it on social media and bits and chucks and pieces you know you at least you have a full platform to tell your story the way you want it okay. it, it and then, and then comes video, right? So, and then, you know, so, you know, not to overwhelm your audience, but what we try to do is we try to compartmentalize and say, okay, look at these are the three things or whatever we're going to do. And, mm-hmm. you know, video is often one of them. Uh, I mentioned speaking to some golf course superintendents from across Canada. Now, these are good business people that, that are responsible for a very large capital budget for golf courses. I told them I'm their worst uh, nightmare going out there shooting a buck 20. I'm the one that leaves the marks everywhere. But anyway, um, I showed them an example of the impact of different social posts in terms mm-hmm. of telling their story. And I said, the lowest power one is just a picture of the fairway. Maybe they did some work on the fairway. The second up from that is a picture of you, a selfie of you with the fairway behind. So it's called we're getting yeah. into personal branding now, it's called, right? Yeah. The third level up is a narration video where you're talking because some people don't want to be in front of the camera. So what you'll do is you'll talk from behind the camera and you'll narrate what's going on in front of the camera. And the ultimate, of course, is a selfie video, you on camera with whatever's in behind you. Mm -hmm. And so I bring up video because, you know, the stats indicate that someone can understand something 60,000 times faster if it's a visual versus text. And if you look at most websites, there's not enough video. And if it is, it's a vendor commercial or it's, it's not. Mm-hmm. And then it, that translates to social media. So we're doing a ton of work right now coaching salespeople mm-hmm. how to tell micro stories on video as little lures in the water mm-hmm. that get bites from customers. Yeah. Uh, so that's very, very popular right now. Yeah, no, that's so critical. You know, when we started doing a video in our business, uh, Rick, you know, we were thinking it's a, it's a part of ours. You know, uh, we, we consider our sales as a part of the service uh, for us. So, you know, just to get a message across, just to communicate with the people. But we didn't realize how important that, you know, video is in a service business as well. Um, you know, you can, you can solve somebody's business problem. But, you know, after solving a problem, if you can record a video, hey, Rick, I did this for you. This is how I solved it. If you need anything. Um, that is even more important because now you're taking care of a client instead of they reading emails from you, they simply just watch a quick video and then you can explain that. So I think it's a power of video in both, um, you know, yeah, for new prospect, but also in a service site. It, it, there's limitless purposes to video. To your, to your point, we've got sales reps that will, and again, on our LinkedIn bootcamp, we talk about shooting a video attaching the file on LinkedIn and you, you know, you, you already know the impact of video because you're on video yourself here. But if someone read a transcript of us talking, it would be completely different experience than, you know, seeing you, et cetera. Um, you know, the other thing too, is that uh, you, you, you bridged into it there, how service organizations are now starting to use video a lot. And mm-hmm. uh, we have a formula that we coach our clients on. It's easy. Anyone can do it. I call it the FAQ video. And so if you and your sales team or you and your customer service team or you and your technical support team got together to your next meeting, you said, hey, what are the top five or 10 questions that customers are asking us all the time? And you just wrote them down Mm -hmm. and you had somebody or each person shoot a video answering that question. Those are power uh, little videos. And Mm -hmm. by the way, I would strongly suggest to keep your videos as short as possible 
Um, we've produced, I got a video team uh, that, that they're, I would say, you know, one of the best in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm a little uh, biased, but they're good. We probably yeah. produced over 10,000 business videos. And what we see in terms of drop off is, is most people when watching like a rock band or an entertainment thing, they'll stay on forever. But when it comes to a business video, they drop off about 35 seconds. And so Although, you know, you and I, we like to look at each other for two minutes or three minutes as we explain whatever it is, we may be the only ones watching our videos. So, mm -hmm. you know, keep it short, stupid would be one of my suggestions as well. But the good thing with the video is you can watch it from all the uh, mobile devices or cell phone or where you are. You know, you don't have to worry about when you get to the office. You can simply run a video no matter where you are um, and quickly watch and skip through it as, as you as you pleasure. So, so in, and to that point, you know, believe it or not, uh, there are fundamentals to shooting a selfie video. Okay. Mm -hmm. That, 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 you know, we have a saying in our business. Okay. And I started a long time ago and got in trouble for it, but I used to say to people, you know, common sense sometimes isn't that common. Okay. For example, we come back to video. Um, you know, you want to shoot a video sideways, not vertical. Okay. Because you know, when mm -hmm. you play it on social media or website, whatever, okay. Little basics or your background. Now, um, you know, we, we work with a large telecom company, a large one, one of the top five in North America. And one of the things we created for them to tell their story was virtual backgrounds that now each of their salespeople that are working remotely all look the same. Mm -hmm. And there's a tagline, a logo. Mm -hmm. And we immediately went from, you know, the closet in the background, the kitchen table, the dog wheeling around and, uh, the, the immediate change in lift was just like, it was incredible. And, wow. you know, you, you Gurmeet, I know you have a large mansion you live in because your business is so successful and you've probably got multiple <laughs> I lots. Wish, at home. I wish that was the case. <laughs> but some of us that work out of a trailer like me, what mm -hmm. we have to do is cover up our background. I'm just saying that a lot of people don't have an office in their home and we push them home. We didn't think, and I always say, you know, people, I think, buy with their eyes before their pocketbooks. So mm -hmm. if you don't look right, it doesn't matter what's coming out of your mouth. You know, the, you know, the credibility is just not there. So you're telling me sometime I record a video, I'll be walking outside um, our office and I'm just walking out and with a selfie stick, I'm recording a video from a customer say, you know, I send you something, take a look, let me know. So I should be doing that, that kind of stuff. I should be sitting down and recording properly, not just shooting video no matter where I am. <laughs> No, 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 no. I, no, I think, I, look, I've watched your videos. I, I, the fact that I'm here today shows great respect for what you, you do. And I think, Thank candidly, you know, you're a, a, a living example of somebody that has gone outside your core business focus to really offer some value. And I don't want to get into kind of, you know, soft speak here, but it is a giving mentality in today's environment. And the simple fact that, you know, I think you've done this and you know, people watching may not understand that, you know, you reached out to me, there's a conversation before this, you know, how are we going to do it, etc. Um, I just applaud people like you, because I think the more people follow your example, your digital footprint's going to get bigger, bigger and bigger. Thank you. And, uh, uh, yeah. you know, I personally believe that sales is about giving, you know, you've got to have a giving mentality if you're in a sales, no matter what, what are you selling? Um, sales is about giving. You got to give value no matter what you do. Every tra you know a transaction with a client, you got to deliver value. Um, so I you know I personally believe that you know um, no matter what you know we're in the service business, but you know even in a sales is more about giving. You know you, you got to give value. You got to give more. You got to be willing to give a lot more um, than you're receiving. I think that's that's how it works. So that's just my my personal view. But thank you. Um, Anything else, Rick? How else uh, business can just, you know, leaders can start preparing? You know, um, we talked about that, you know, the lot of uh, story building, sales, you know, structure of the meetings, they can start doing some of that stuff now. Um, you don't have to wait for that, you know, the whole pandemic is over. Anything in your mind that they can be doing it right now? They've been preparing strategy as they're planning their business uh, when they're going to be back. I think three quick things. Number one is elevate your level of approach when you're prospecting. Mm -hmm. Most people are still calling into mid-management and when the pandemic hit, if not before the pandemic, that middle rung of management are nervous, apprehensive to maybe recommend change and or protecting the current incumbent vendor, which may not be you. Mm -hmm. So we're spending a lot of time coaching, uh, you know, calling high C-level. 
you know, as a business owner, Gurmeet itself, same as myself and your viewer, there's no one that cares and or would be as open to something that would help your business as the business leader. And unfortunately, yeah. too many sales reps start a rung below and they get dismissed. The second thing would be paid advertising. Mm -hmm. um, we brought in some talent about a year ago to start doing paid advertising for our customers. And it's a scary thing for a lot of business leaders. They don't know how much it's going to cost, et cetera. But you can get into that now for as low as like 500 to 1,000 bucks a month. And it basically is going to give you a VIP pass on Google mm -hmm. right to the front of the line where your customers are. It's like dangling the, you know, the, 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 the fish hook right in front of where the fish is. And the last thing, you know, you're talking a couple of times like the pandemic's over and I don't know, maybe you're seeing a crystal ball. I'm not, but the, the, I don't think it's going to be back to the way it was maybe mm -hmm. ever. And, and I think people, some of them have given up on these virtual events and we're still seeing them as the number one lead generation driver. And what we're doing with our clients that your people should be doing is when you host an event, it doesn't have to be an hour. It could be like 20 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And then take that video, put it on your website, put it behind a form. So someone has to surrender their information to get at the video. You mm -hmm. know, by the way, the video is probably about answering a question like we talked about before or something, not about a product or service. And um, we're just finding those are, so calling higher, uh, considering paid advertising, and uh, lastly would be, you know, don't back off in the virtual events. I think there's still a great horse right now to ride uh, nice. pandemic or not. Yeah, I know those are great points, you know, I, and, and, you know, you can, you know, those three, you know, items you mentioned, right, people should be doing that, you know, um, all year round, you know, that, that's something you cannot take your foot off the gas, right? So you have to be doing those, those three things all year round, if, especially if you looking, you know, have a goals and you're trying to, uh, you know, get somewhere in a business, you know, if you're looking for growth. Very interesting. Um, what is, what's for you, uh, you know, over 2021, the rest of the year, Rick, um, what's uh, coming up in, in your, um, um, you know, path in both, uh, you know, sell to win and, uh, you know, into communication? Uh, what's looking like, you know, in, in your path to where, where are you trying to get to? So, so we're releasing, uh, it's going to come out late uh, summer, or sorry, late, late spring, early summer. I just recorded a brand new training program called uh, digital sales bootcamp. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think it's going to be a world beater. Um, all our training, a lot of it now is video based modules with playbooks, et cetera, but we're going to walk people through, you know, what is your personal brand? So, mm -hmm. so we're training MBAs uh, now at uh, one of Canada's most respected programs here at Ivy in London. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, in the olden days, we used to sell our product and our company. And now believe it or not, the individual branding is in the mix Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to coach people on prospecting, how to do a virtual sales call, um, presentation skills, uh, how to shoot selfie videos, and the last modules on what to shoot in a selfie video, some of which I've discussed today. But mm -hmm. we use examples, how to do it, et cetera. That's on the sell to win side. We're excited about that horse coming out. On the into side, you know, we just want, I just want to thank our customers and, and people that have given us an opportunity. Like we're seeing tremendous growth on the digital marketing side which again, bleeds into our digital sales training, yada, yada. But mm -hmm. um, I'm just really appreciative of the customers that have stuck with us. I'm sure you've had customers too that could have made yeah. some changes, but uh, I think we're scoring a lot of goals right now, which is creating interest in other companies. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I think you got to select your digital marketing agency or your sales coach, mm -hmm. like you're picking a lawyer for a course you have to win nowadays. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully some things I talked about today would help you do a little dipstick on your business to help mm -hmm. you uh, sell to win. Definitely. There's so much, uh, you know, I learned so much from our discussion and I'm sure, you know, the business people are watching there, there's so much value they can, they can draw from. And definitely, you know, just a discussion. I would strongly recommend just, just, uh, you know, give you a call and just have a chat with you and, and get your take on a lot of lot things they're struggling with. And in some time, you know, we, we all make a decision in isolation. Sometimes you're trying to make a decision in on both sales and marketing and, and you just have a lot of blind spots. You just don't have information. Um, I would strongly suggest that, you know, pick up phone and call you. We send this video um, to all of our, our, you know, clients and also, uh, you know, people in our, our database. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, you know, include your uh, contact information in uh, the, the video as well. So if somebody wants to reach out to you, um, they have your contact information to reach out, uh, out to you. What is the best way to find, uh, what's the best uh, approach to you, a way to find you and, and uh, uh, where can the find, uh, find you, Rick? So there's a, a social media platform called LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> That's where I am. And, and you can follow me or find me on LinkedIn and you'll see either how to do it or what not to do. Trust me. I give a bit of both. Yeah. yeah. 
You know, one thing I learned from your LinkedIn page, uh, Rick, I was looking at it. And normally when you click on, uh, you know, on that, the, the speaker beside your name, people say the name, you know, you know uh, to identify themselves. But you had a whole, whole uh, you know, a uh, couple of sentences about, you know, what do you do in a business? I thought that was very interesting. You know, something I, I had to, you know, learn as well. You know, why can't I do that? Um, you know, I just I was just speaking my name. Yeah, people need to know how you pronounce your name. But more importantly, you know, another chance to get your message across. It's called Sell to Win. That's the name of the company, buddy. You got to have all the wheels turning, all the wheels turning in the right direction. Very interesting. Yes. I, you know, I learned so much, Rick. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Well, thank you, Gurmeet. And again, congrats on what you're doing. I think more sales and business leaders should uh, follow your footsteps in terms of this video content because, uh, you know, you're a guy that, you know, running an IT services business. And who'd have thought, you know, you'd be hosting a, a video program like this with so many great videos. And I've watched several of them and I think you got some great content on there. Hopefully people are taking advantage of. All right. Thank you so much, Rick. I hope so. Thanks for having me, buddy. All right. Take care.